afternoon, everyone. Sorry about the delay. This is Abe Kolongar. Uh, I'm thrilled that everyone's here uh, on today's webinar. Uh, health impacts related to PFAS is a priority for ASTO, and ASTO continues to work with states and federal agencies to help provide resources on this topic. Uh, I'd like to highlight two examples of ASTO's work on PFAS. Um, ASTO, with the support of CDC and ATSDR, has funded the New York State Department of Health and the Pennsylvania Department of Health to carry biomonitoring efforts for PFAS. Um, and the second project I'd, I'd like to highlight is with the support of EPA, ASTO, and the Environmental Council of States, interviewed environment, environmental and health agency staff from six states on how they frame their risk communications around PFAS. Um, these two uh, projects uh, have been a great success, and you can get additional information on what I just outlined on ASTO's website. Uh, again, on behalf of ASTO, I'd like to thank you for joining us, and I'd also like to thank ATSDR and EPA for presenting on today's webinar. And so with that, I'll turn it over to our moderator, Nick Porter. Great, thank you so much, Abe. Um, so before we get started, uh, I wanted to go over uh, the objectives for today's webinar. Um, they're listed on the slide on your screen. Um, so today's objectives are to outline the key initiatives of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's recently released PFAS Action Plan, uh, highlight various U.S. EPA research initiatives designed to assist public health officials in addressing PFAS contamination and human exposures, highlight various resources from the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry designed to help public health officials address PFAS contamination and human exposures, and describe ongoing and future ATSDR efforts to assess human exposures and potential health effects from various PFAS chemicals. Today, today we'll feature uh, speakers from EPA and ATSDR. From EPA, we'll have Hannah Holsinger and Dr. Andrew Gillespie. And from ATSDR, we'll have Dr. Christopher Ray. To get started, uh, we'll start with ATSDR and Dr. Christopher Ray. For more than 25 years, Dr. Ray has been a leader in the areas of environmental and occupational health. He began his career at CDC NIOSH as an industrial hygienist. And during these 12 years, his research focused on isocyanates, mercury, halogenated solvents, magnetic fields, and exposures during forest fire fighting. Dr. Ray also has 17 years of private sector experience serving as an environmental health, workplace safety, and sustainability executive with Fortune, Fortune 100 companies. During this period, he was responsible for the strategic global leadership and governance for all aspects of work, workplace safety and health, water stewardship, energy efficiency, and renewable energy, sustainable packaging and recycling, business continuity planning, and risk management. Dr. Ray also served as the chairman and a member of the Board of Health for the city of Westboro, Massachusetts, where he was dedicated to improving the level of public health for this community. Dr. Ray received his BS in administrative management from Clemson University, earned his MS in environmental health at the University of Cincinnati, and his PhD in environmental health engineering from Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Ray, are you there? Yes, I am. Go ahead and take it away, thank you. Okay, if we can go to the first slide. So just want to provide a quick, but first, thank you for Nick for the introduction and it truly is my honor to be here to speak and uh, to ASTO and, and to talk about some of the exciting and important work that we're doing here at ATSDR to better understand exposures and health effects associated with PFAS. I just want to ground the audience a little bit with some background information on PFAS. I, I'm sure this is a uh, review uh, for most of those on the line, but per, PFAS are the per, per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. These have been around since the 1950s. There's over 5,000 uh, chemicals in this class of substances, and they've been used in a wide variety of industrial applications and consumer products. The the main feature of the PFAS chemicals is the strong fluorine carbon uh, 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 bound, bind, and it's one of the strongest chemical connections known to man. And because of this, it gives the PFAS compounds the features that make it uh, advantageous in consumer products and in industry, but it also uh, uh, provide, gives it some characteristics that also make it a serious concern for environmental health. These are th these compounds are extreme, extremely persistent in the environment and in our bodies. They typically resist uh, normal environmental degradation processes. 
They have long half-lives, especially considered to, compared to other environmental uh, uh, toxic compounds. Uh, for the general population, our most common source of exposure is through ingestion, and with that being through drinking water. And PFAS has been found in drinking water systems across the country, and in recent studies have estimated that uh, uh, as high as 100 million people in this country have been exposed to PFAS. Next slide. Here, here at ATSDR, we have several efforts uh, uh, ongoing to better understand exposures and health effects and the effects these exposures have on communities uh, across the country. And so we're going to talk a little bit today about some of the health consultation work and site work we're doing uh, at ATSDR and also about our three really large, larger PFAS-related efforts, our exposure assessment study, our PEAS proof of concept study in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and our national multi-site health study that we just released the notice of funding opportunity. Uh, we'll also uh, briefly touch upon some additional PFAS projects that we have ongoing and on some of the tools and resources that we have here at ATSDR. Next slide. So, so as many of you know, ATSDR was established through the CERCLA legislation and through our congressional mandate, one of our main activities is the health consultation and site work that we conduct across the country. And this is work that we partner quite strongly with many of our state partners in conducting our community health investigations. And and it's been a partnership that has worked quite well over the years. And, and this is no different from PFAS. Uh, we have uh, over 30 uh, PFAS community health investigations and in some form of, of progress as we speak. We're partnering with the states and the local health officials and, and uh, tribal health officials in some cases as, as we conduct these studies. And typically, these studies have center on PFAS, uh, communities getting their PFAS exposure from drinking water that has been contaminated with uh, AFFF or aqueous film forming foam. And, and these are typically associated with firefighting training areas or uh, some sort of military base or airport. Next slide. So this is a brief overview of the timeline that we have at ATSDR for some of our, our larger studies. Uh, uh, we're going to go through each of, of these efforts in, in more detail as part of this presentation. But as I previously mentioned, there, we started with our PFAS exposure assessments. Um, as part of this work, we're also looking at how we engage communities in doing PFAS uh, exposure and health studies which will provide us with information that will better inform how we in general engage communities as ATSDR uh, uh, works uh, within states and communities. We'll give you a little information around the PEAS proof of concept and finally end with uh, uh, some uh, talk a little bit about the national multi-site study we have for PFAS. Next slide. So when we think about uh, the PFAS exposure assessment work, uh, of course, as I previously mentioned, some of this work started with community health investigations, but we also realized an important need to provide some guidance to state, local, tribal, and territorial health departments on how to assess PFAS in their communities. And this resulted in the development of a toolkit that we call the PEAT, the PFAS Exposure Assessment technical toolkit. And we uh, collaborated with ASTO in this work. It was a great collaboration. And, and as Nick uh, mentioned previously, uh, Pennsylvania and New York, through this partnership, field tested our PEAT kit. And these were our, our first real scientific efforts to better understand PFAS exposures in communities. We, we learned a lot 
from the work that uh, Pennsylvania and New York did, and it has really helped us to refine our larger exposure assessment protocol, as well to help inform those communities in those states on the PFAS issues that they are facing, and, and on trying to inform their communities on how to deal with these exposures. So as a result of this work, we, um, uh, through the National Defense Authorization Act, uh, CDC ATSDR was uh, uh, commissioned to conduct no less than eight exposure assessments in communities where their PFAS exposure is associated with nearby military installations and AFFF, as I previously mentioned. And we just recently announced those eight facilities. You can see them here on the map. I'm sure most on the line have already uh, 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 have already seen this announcement, especially if you have uh, one of these sites in your state, I, we have already been in touch with you. So we continue to move forward with this work. Um, the exposure assessment protocol will uh, be a, uh, a randomized statistical sampling uh, based protocol. So we're not good, it's not gonna be convenient sampling. Uh, uh, we are going to be using randomized sampling. We're going to be looking at serum PFAS levels. We're going to be measuring participants' blood for 12 PFAS compounds. And, uh, uh, and there's also other aspects of the exposure assessment. Next slide. I, I kind of got ahead of myself there, but... Uh, 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 this is information that ev I'm sure everybody on the line is very familiar with. It's the standard exposure assessment process. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, we will be using uh, randomly selected individuals from households in a community. Uh, uh, we will be looking at blood and urine samples, uh, measuring each for different, for the blood for 12 different PFAS compounds, the urine samples, I believe, for 18 different PFAS compounds. We will also be collecting some uh, household dust as part of this uh, uh, protocol to, so that we can start generating some information on the effect of any PFAS bound to household dust on someone's exposure profile. Um, we expect these studies to, uh, uh, we expect to be in the field very soon, probably in the next few, in the next month or so, and we expect the studies will be staggered, and we expect this to be completed in about a, a year and a half. Um, we have announced uh, uh, the first two sites as part of this process. The first site is Hamden County, Massachusetts, near the uh, Barnes Air National Guard Base, and the second site will be the Berkeley County uh, uh, site in West Virginia. Next slide. Uh, to, to build on the exposure assessment protocol, we realize that, that many, if not all of us, are very interested in better understanding the health outcomes associated with this important class of chemicals. And, and the PEAS proof of concept is a proof of concept study to evaluate exposure and health outcomes simultaneously. Um, in, in this exposure, we'll look at several different endpoints uh, within the PEAS community, uh, health endpoints. We are right now waiting for final approval for the PEAS study from OMB. We expect to start the work in uh, the summer of 2019. And it's important to mention that this proof of concept is th the pilot for the much larger multi-site health study. So the multi-site protocol builds on what we learned from Pete in the States, what we learned from the exposure assessment, and what we are going to learn from the PEACE proof of concept. Next slide. I mentioned earlier that we just released the notice of funding opportunity for the multi-site health study. This is a study where we're, again, going to look at exposure and health outcomes so that we can better understand uh, the risk for health effects for people exposed to PFAS compounds. Um, we're going to look at many specific health, employ health endpoints, uh, such as lipid metabolism, kidney function, thyroid disease, liver disease, glycemic parameters, 
diabetes and immune response. We're seeking to enroll about 6,000 adults and 2,000 children uh, within the multi-site study. Next slide. And, and this, is, this is not just the end of the work here at ATSDR. We are looking at several other uh, uh, studies and, and initiatives related to PFAS so that we can better understand the relationship between exposure, dose, and health outcomes. And some of the studies we're looking at, you will notice in the multi-site, we did not talk about cancer. The, uh, the sample size for the multi-site and the resources devoted to it are, are, are in a manner that uh, cancer is not really an endpoint we can study through this protocol, but we are definitely looking at other ways to help answer some of the questions that are coming from communities, coming from states, related to the connection between PFAS exposure and possibly carcinogenic effects. Uh, uh, so we're looking at some ecological analyses to get a better understanding of PFAS and cancer. We're also uh, uh, looking at some methods for reconstructing uh, historical dose exposures in the PEAS community. Um, we're looking at, we have an interesting study that we've kicked off looking at community resilience and how psychosocial stress related to PFAS exposures may pose an independent health risk to people living in those communities that are dealing with this issue. And finally, we're, we're, uh, 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 we've assembled a team to look at physiologically based pharmacokinetic models uh, to estimate pure fat, PFAS serum levels resulting from water exposures. So a, a water to serum conversion model. Next slide. Finally, I, I know I'm running short on time, uh, but it's important to note that we have a lot of resources and information that's available for our, the ASTO members and those in state, local, and tribal health departments and for those in the general community. Most of these are available through our, our uh, uh, website. Of course, you can go on the website and if you're interested in assessing exposures in, in your community, you can download the PEAT tool, the PFAS Exposure Assessment Toolkit, and, and we would be happy to provide advice and consultation with you if you're interested in using the toolkit. There is also the, the draft toxicological profile related to PFAS. We're in the final stages of responding to uh, the many review comments that we received on our, on our, talk, our PFAS tox profile. We think we will be going to publication with this later in June. Uh, that's what we're shooting for, at least here within ATSDR. We also have a variety of PFAS fact sheets. And finally, we have some PFAS guidelines for clinicians. And I, I just want to end by saying that uh, uh, if there are some information needs that you need, please feel free to reach out to myself or anyone on the ATSDR staff and with your questions or your information needs, and we will be more than happy to, to respond and see how we can work with you to meet those needs. We, we realize this is a difficult topic to talk to communities and to people about because Everybody wants to be able to get a blood measurement and to be able to say, if my measurement is this amount, then it's going to result in these health effects, and here's what my doctor needs to know. And as we all know on the line, the environmental epidemiology is not there yet, but we're trying to get there, and we're working very hard here at ATSDR to generate the right data, the right information, and the right analyses so that in the near future, we'll be able to better, better informed, exposed people on their health risk. So again, if, there, if you've run across some information needs or some questions on how to deal with some difficult uh, uh, questions from communities or, or people within your region, we'd be more than happy to share our experience and help. And with that, thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Ray, for that presentation. And uh, as I said before, we'll take questions at the end. So please hold your questions until then or type them into the chat box now. Um, great, all right, well, moving on, um, we are going to hear uh, from EPA's Hannah Holsinger. Uh, Hannah Holsinger is a physical scientist with the United States Environmental Protection Agency 
and she currently serves as the Drinking Water Program's PFAS lead for the Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water, as well as supporting the agency in coordination of PFAS activities. In addition to her PFAS work at OGWDW, she supports the development of the Microbial Contaminant Candidate List and has previously worked a range of drinking water issues, including cyanotoxins, Legionella, endocrine disruptors, and disinfection byproducts. Prior to joining the US EPA in 2011, she was a public health fellow in OGWDW for two years. Hannah has a Bachelor of Science from Virginia Tech, double major in Biological Sciences and Food Science and Technology, and a Master's of Public Health focusing on environmental health from the University of Kentucky. She is currently a doctoral student at Johns Hopkins University in Environmental Health and Engineering. Anna, go ahead and take it away. Hi, can, can you hear me okay? Yep, you're coming through just fine. Okay, great. Um, go ahead and move to the next slide. Oh, this is perfect. Um, so I'll, I'll give a brief background and, and recognize that the last presentation kind of went over some of this. So I'll go through these introductory slides fairly quickly. So, um, so PFAS, as, as stated before, is a group of man-made chemicals that have been in use since the 1940s. Um, there's many different types of PFAS chemicals, including some of the more common ones uh, folks online have probably been hearing about, because PFOA, PFAS, as well as genetic chemicals, which are the H HF. PO dimer acid and its potassium salt. Next slide. So what are PFAS? Um, as previously mentioned, um, due to their strong carbon fluorine bonds, um, they are very useful chemicals in industry and they have been um, used for, for a very long time and they can be very persistent in the environment um, with uh, degradation periods of years, decades, or even longer under natural conditions. Um, two of the most studied PFOA are, um, or excuse me, two of the most studied PFAS or PFOA and PFOS. Next slide. Um, due to their widespread use, um, they have been found in um, many different array of consumer products like cookware, food packaging, um, anything that would be stain and water resistant, such as uses in fabrics, carpets, and different outerwear like rain jackets and such. Um, they um, can be found and where PFAS manufacturing and processing facilities occurs, as well as in airports and military installments due to their use in firefighting zones. Next slide. Due to their widespread use and environmental persistence, most people and have been exposed to PFAS at some point in time in their life. Um, some of the PFAS are able to accumulate and stay in the human body for long periods of time. Um, there's also evidence that exposure to certain PFAS may lead to adverse health effects. Uh, next slide. Now I'll go on to talk about um, a bit of EPA's previous PFAS work before going into talking about the most recent um, PFAS action plan put out by EPA. Um, so certain PFAS chemicals are no longer manufactured in the U.S., um, including um, EPA um, had a PFOA stewardship program and in which eight companies um, each of the largest manufacturing uh, producers of PFOA um, put into an agreement that they would uh, no longer produce PFOA, and all of those eight companies did meet their program goals by 2015. EPA has issued various significant new use rules. Um, EPA has also monitored for six PFAS chemicals under the Safe Drinking Water Act under the Unregulated Contaminant Monitoring Rule to help understand nationwide occurrence of PFAS in our drinking water systems. Um, EPA obviously, um, also in 2016 released uh, lifetime health advisories for PFOA PFOS of 70 parts per trillion combined or um, individual. Next slide. EPA has been uh, working to advance the research on PFAS chemicals to better understand their impacts um, to health environment as well as different exposure pathways, options for treatment and removal, and Andy will be talking um, a lot more in depth about the research side at EPA on PFAS. Um, EPA has also released draft toxicity assessments for Gen X uh, chemicals and PFBS. Also uh, has announced the initiation of assessments for five additional PFAS, um, such as PFBA, PFHXS, PFHXA, PFNA, and PFDA under the IRIS program. Um, EPA has issued enforcement orders as well as provided some oversight for federal cleanup um, and assisted uh, states with their enforcement actions as well. Um, EPA has provided technical assistance related to dozens of areas that have had PFAS contamination across the country. 
Next slide. A little bit of background on uh, the development of the action plan. So in May 2018, um, EPA held um, at uh, headquarters in D.C. a two-day National Leadership Summit on PFAS. This brought together more than 200 federal, state, tribal, and local leaders across the country to discuss moving forward on PFAS. Following the summit, agency hosted a series of sites, a series of visits um, throughout the summer of 2018 to communities that were uh, directly impacted um, by, by PFAS, um, including there were community engagements, events in Exeter, New Hampshire, Horsham, Pennsylvania, Colorado Springs, Colorado, Fayetteville, North Carolina, and Leavenworth, Kansas, um, as well as there were roundtables held in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and Michigan, and there are also uh, tribal events in uh, Spokane, Washington. Um, following uh, the, the, communi the community events, um, EPA, the EPA PFAS action plan, it was developed based on the feedback from all of those events. In addition, um, uh, following the summit, there we opened a public docket and we received over 120,000 comments submitted to that docket. So using the feedback we, we um, gained from the site events as well as the public docket, we, we fed that into the development of the EPA uh, PFAS action plan. Next slide. So the plan is uh, EPA's first multimedia, multi-program national research management risk communication plan to address a challenge like PFAS. So this is not a, there's not an office of EPA that is not touched by PFAS. Um, this responds to the extensive public input the agency received over the last year, including the, the different uh, community events, as well as the National Leadership Summit, as well as using the comments from the docket. And this uh, action plan provides uh, necessary tools to assist states, tribes, and communities in addressing PFAS. Next slide. So now I'll move into talking about some key highlighted actions that is within uh, the EPA's PFAS action plan. And if you'd like to see a copy of the plan, it is on um, our, our website. It's EPA or www.epa.gov backslash PFAS. So you can find the action plan there. Um, so first I'll talk about some of the highlighted actions for drinking water. So EPA is committed to following the NCL rulemaking process as established by the Safe Drinking Water Act. And as a next step in that process, EPA will propose a regulatory determination for PFOA, PFOS by the end of this year. Um, EPA is also gathering and evaluating information to determine if regulation is appropriate for other chemicals in the PFAS family as well. Next slide. So for cleanup, EPA is uh, working to facilitate cleanup, cleanup efforts by providing groundwater cleanup recommendations. Um, the EPA is also initiating regulatory determine, the regu regulatory development process for listing certain PFAS as hazardous substances. Next slide. For uh, additional monitoring, um, so EPA conducted monitoring under UCMR for the third uh, monitoring rule. Um, EPA has uh, in in the, in the action plan committed to proposing um, additional nationwide drinking water monitoring for PFAS under the next UCMR cycle. So there's currently UCMR 4 is ongoing monitoring right now, but we intend to uh, include additional PFAS on, on the next uh, monitoring cycle. So research, I'll, I'll skim over this quickly and you'll go into this much more detail, but EPA is working to rapidly expand the scientific foundation for understanding and managing risks from PFAS. Um, and the research is organized around understanding toxicity, understanding the exposures, assessing risks, and identifying effective treatment and, remedi and remediation actions. Next slide. Moving on to our toxics program. Um, EPA is considering and evaluating the addition of PFAS chemicals to the toxic release inventory. Um, EPA is also issu issuing a supplemental proposal to guard against unreviewed reintroduction and the new use through domestic production or import of certain PFAS chemicals in the United States. So issuing additional snares. Next slide. Moving on to enforcement. Uh, EPA will continue to use enforcement tools when they're appropriate to address um, exposures in the environment as well as continue uh, to assess, to assist states with their enforcement activities. And on risk communication, um, EPA is working to develop risk communication materials, inform risk communication toolbox, and that will include uh, multimedia materials, uh, different messaging for federal, state, and tribal and local partners to help you to explain uh, the risks from PFAS um, to the public. Next slide. So 
to implement the plan, uh, EPA will continue. Um, EPA's, uh, we've uh, worked closely with, with states and, and federal partners uh, through our past and ongoing actions, and EPA plans to continue to work in close coordination with other federal agencies, um, states and tribes and local governments and different entities, different water utilities, and the industry and the public to, to continue to move forward on many of these actions that are included in the plan. Um, and as um, and as available, EPA will continue to provide updates on the different actions outlined in the plan on the agency's PFAS website. So, um, so this is, again, the epa.gov backslash PFAS. So that's where um, we've been putting additional um, updates as they occur. And uh, you can also find a copy of EPA's PFAS action plan on that website. Um, next slide, you can probably skip the next one. That's for questions, which I believe we'll be holding on to the end. So um, uh, here's my contact, uh, holdsinger at hannahepa.gov. So, so feel free to reach out if you have any um, specific questions that we might not get to at the end of this meeting. Great. Thank you so much, Hannah, for that presentation. Um, moving on to our last speaker of the day, um, we have Dr. Andrew Gillespie. Um, Dr. Gillespie is the Associate Director for Ecology at US EPA's National Exposure Research Laboratory and concurrently serves as the Executive Lead for all EPA PFAS-related research, including human and ecological toxicity, exposure, analytical methods, and PFAS treatment and remediation. Dr. Gillespie joined the US EPA in 2004 after serving 15 years with the US Forest Service in a variety of research and research leadership positions. He holds a BS degree from Humboldt State University in forest engineering and both MS and PH degrees in forest biometry from the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Uh, Dr. Gillespie, are you there? I am, Nick. Can you hear me okay? Yep, you're coming through just fine. Thanks. Okay. Great, thank you. All right, well, I'll take it from here then. So um, yes, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you also for giving us the opportunity to give you a quick overview of the science um, that we're doing here at EPA. So I work closely with Hannah Holsinger, the previous speaker. Um, I'm located in the Office of Research at EPA, but uh, for purposes of PFAS research, I work pretty much with all of the different programs and regions of EPA and through them with our stakeholders. So I'm going to give a quick overview of the science that we're doing right now and um, be happy to, to follow up with anybody who wants a deeper dive into any of the particular topics. So next slide, please. So the obligatory uh, introductory slide, the, the things I want to emphasize right here are that um, a couple of things that make PFAS very challenging from a research perspective. One is it's very complicated chemistry. There's thousands of different variations of these PFAS molecules that exist in commerce. There's probably hundreds to thousands more um, that include different breakdown products as the chemicals degrade um, into other PFAS and other substances. They're widely used in many different processes and in consumer products. So there's lots of different sources of lots of different molecules, lots of different potential pathways for fate and transport. Um, so it's a very complicated environment when it comes to understanding risk. And at least some of these PFAS chemicals are known to be what we call PBT at EPA. So they're persistent in the environment. They last a long time. Um, they can be bioaccumulative in organisms building up in food chains, and some of them are toxic at relatively low levels. So when we see chemicals that meet these three criteria, um, that's generally a flag to us that uh, it's a class of chemicals worthy of some research. Next slide, please. Um, those of you that know EPA and know how we approach research, we often use um, for many years what we call this risk paradigm, when we, we want to understand the risk of a, of a chemical stress or a contaminant in the environment. We look at several different things. One dimension has to do with toxicity. Um, how likely is it that the chemical can cause an adverse effect in a person or in an organism um, based on exposure? We also want to understand what is the exposure of the chemical? What is the, the sources and the pathways that the chemicals move through the environment? And what ultimately is the dose um, that impacts um, a person or an organism? And when you understand those two things, the toxicity and the dose, then you can start to really understand maybe what is the risk of that chemical in that particular exposure scenario. And then once we understand the risk, um, identifying effective treatments and remediation actions for either removing or mitigating or protecting against that risk. So much of our research at EPA is organized using this paradigm, and, and that's how we're organizing the PFAS research as well. Um, so in the next few slides, I'm going to talk through some of the different lines of research that we have underway to address these different areas. Um, and at the end, I'll finish up with a little bit about some of the ongoing collaborations that we have. Next slide, please. Um, so on the topic of human health toxicity concerns, there's a, a very large lack of toxicity information for many of these PFAS compounds. We have a lot of information for a small number, things like PFOA and PFOS, which have been around a long time. 
we have less information for a, a, another smaller set of maybe 10 to 20 to 30 chemicals. And then beyond that, there's very little out there. So we really have two prongs to our research effort for dealing with human health toxicity. Um, one prong is focused on dealing with the chemicals for which we do have data. So at EPA, we identified a list of 31 different PFAS chemicals that were of concern to us and our stakeholders based on, on what we knew of exposure and things that were out there. Uh, we did a quick literature search for that, and, and we found a subset of about 20, 21 of those chemicals for which we felt there was enough published peer-reviewed scientific information to support um, the derivation of what we call our standard reference toxicity values, so things like reference doses and reference concentrations. These are the kinds of numbers produced by the IRIS program. Um, I think Heather mentioned that in the previous presentation. Um, so we are slating um, several of these PFAS chemicals for uh, development of draft toxicity assessments, which will be go out for public comment um, and then peer review and ultimately would be finalized. So we've got a set of, of two which have already been through those different comment stages and we're in the final stages of wrapping up for HFPODA and uh, for PFBS and then five additional chemicals um, which are entering the IRIS program um, and should be uh, worked on over the next year. But because there are so many other chemicals out there that we don't have much information about, the second prong of our research is using some of our high throughput screening computational toxicology testing approaches to try to get a better understanding of the whole universe of PFAS toxicity. And so we've got an experiment underway where we've gotten samples of 150 different PFAS compounds. And we selected these based on, on their uh, representation in chemical physical space. So we looked at different structures, different chemical components, trying to not necessarily focus on a particular set that we cared about, individual chemicals, but really trying to get a representative uh, sample of chemicals from the whole physical universe of PFAS that we could, that we could acquire um, to run through some of our assays. And so we're running these chemicals through about seven different um, classes of, of in vitro kinds of assays at the moment. And the hope is that when we get this done, we will have a, a very good data set that would give us some preliminary information about how different categories and different classes of PFAS chemicals cause different um, biochemical reactions that might lead to adverse effects, either in humans or in other organisms. Um, so this would give us a database for, um, for example, for prioritizing subsets of those chemicals for further study, maybe using some animal models, or could also uh, be information that we use in a, in a computational approach for what we call read across, enabling us to make inferences about the toxicity of some chemicals where we don't have uh, any other kind of standard animal data. Um, so the next slide, please. So the complement to that in the EPA, we also look at ecological toxicity. Um, and there's a similar lack of ecological toxicity information for this class of PFOS compounds. Uh, this research is really just getting underway. Um, we're starting to review and gather literature um, on the different uh, publications dealing with different PFOS chemicals in the environment. I'm loading that into our Ecotox database, which is a public database of, of different ecological endpoints and, uh, and chemicals. Um, we're developing some research plans really that is going to focus on trying to identify the sensitive taxa that are in the environment, taxa that are sensitive to the PFAS exposures, um, looking at bioaccumulation through food webs, and ultimately trying to derive uh, or do the science that would help our program office colleagues derive benchmarks and thresholds um, uh, for making cleanup decisions and regulatory decisions and other kind of protective decisions um, that those parts of EPA um, are often involved with. So we've got about 60 chemicals in the database already that we've been able to find um, some ecological information on. Um, we'll, be, we'll be using what we call our adverse outcome pathways as an organizational framework for this. So this is a, uh, a way of, of mapping the interactions that happen between a chemical and the actual uh, organismic responses to that chemical, which ultimately results in some kind of an adverse outcome. Um, and so it's a way of, of documenting this information in a standardized manner. Um, and then applying it to multiple chemicals that, that cause um, similar kinds of, of adverse effects as a result of a similar kind of molecular chain. So it feeds in very nicely to some of our toxicological modeling approaches, not only on the ecological side, uh, but on the human health side as well. And the goal here would be to provide our stakeholders um, with ecotoxicity information to support management decisions needed to, uh, to protect those resources. Next slide, please. Um, analytical methods is a, a pretty significant area of research for us right now. There's, uh, there's just been a general lack of standardized, um, repeatable methods for measuring um, these different PFAS compounds in the environment. Uh, we started several years ago developing a set of methods, which we call method 537.1, um, for measuring a, a set of 18 different PFAS chemicals in drinking water specifically. So this was the method that was used some years ago 
for EPA's um, UCMR monitoring um, that identified some, some initial uh, locations across the country where there were some, some documented problems with PFAS in drinking water supplies. Um, we're continuing to evolve this work. There's a, a second method being developed right now for a somewhat different set of PFAS chemicals, focusing on what we call some of the shorter chains, so some of the, the six carbon and the four carbon molecules. Um, and this will be a, a complementary method um, that would also be able to be used by, by different stakeholders to identify PFAS in drinking water um, supplies. We're also developing some similar methods um, for what we call non-potable or non-drinking water, so things like groundwater and surface water, and by extension um, into things like biosolids and sediments um, and other, other media that are not necessarily um, treated the same as the drinking water supply. So we've got two different methods that are being developed and, and validated across multiple laboratories right now, one using direct injection, which is a mass spectrometry technique that we often use within EPA, and then another variation of that using isotope dilution, which is used by Department of Defense and, and many other organizations. Uh, we're in the early stages of developing some methods for sampling and analyzing air emissions. Um, we know that there is a fair bit of PFAS that goes up the industrial stacks from chemical producing plants and chemical uh, or manufacturing facilities that use PFAS chemicals. And so we're developing a, a method to collect samples from those emission stacks and then bring them back to the lab and, and analyze them and figure out what's in there. And then finally, the, another line of work that we've done for some years now, all the methods that I talked about previously are what we call um, targeted methods. So there's a list of analytes and the method is approved to look for that list of analytes. Um, with non-targeted, it's, it's an application of high resolution mass spectrometry where we don't really know what we're looking for, but we, just, we can take a sample and basically identify everything that's in that sample and then try to work back from, from the data that we generate to figure out what is that exactly is the molecule that's causing a particular, a particular response, particular signal. So this is the work that we've used to identify um, some previously unknown PFAS chemicals. For example, we've done a lot of work in the last few years in the Cape Fear River of North Carolina, in particular downstream from a chemical manufacturing plant. And we gathered and, and published some of the data that showed things like Gen X and, and some other previously unknown to us um, PFAS compounds that were making it into the drinking water and ultimately making it into the uh, drinking water supply of, of a city downriver. Um, and so by extending this research, we're trying to, to make these methods, um, building a library of the different signals so that we can share information, share data with other organizations and try to figure out how to identify more quickly when we're encountering, discovering a new PFAS in the environment. And so taking collectively all this work the goal is to provide reliable analytical methods to our stakeholders to test for both known and to discover um, new and previously unknown PFAS in water, in solids, and in air. Next slide, please. Um, on the exposure side, there's uh, also a general lack of knowledge on all the different sources um, and site-specific concentrations and the different fate and transport pathways um, of how PFAS moves through the environment and ultimately impacts a human and ecological receptor. Uh, and so in addition to developing and testing methods, we're also developing databases and models um, trying to better characterize what are the different sources of PFAS and how does that PFAS move through the environment. And ultimately what we want to do is to be able to uh, identify models for, for basically quantifying and parsing out what are the different pathways um, that move from a source to a receptor to a person or the ecosystem um, and which ones are the ones that matter the most, which pathways are the ones that are are the best targets for some kind of intervention, regulatory or management intervention, um, in order to reduce an exposure and, and to protect public health and the environment um, by managing exposures. Um, and so we're looking at different ways of sampling and, and characterizing sites, and in particular, some of the more heavily contaminated sites, as has been alluded to, um, often associated with applications of, of firefighting foam um, and training facilities, places where we have very complex uh, mixtures of PFAS and other chemicals in the environment so trying to do a better job of understanding what is the extent of the contamination um, and what are the things that people potentially could be exposed to from that. Um, and so the goal here would be to just assemble a database um, and models for making predictions about what are the key pathways and, and which ones are the likely targets for some kind of intervention. Next slide, please. Drinking water treatment. Um, we have a, a, a large laboratory in Cincinnati, Ohio, which for many years has, has done um, a lot of pioneering engineering work on how to, to treat and manage drinking water supplies, everything from individual household systems all the way up to major cities. 
Um, and again, like with other PFAS chemicals, there's a, a lack of, of known technology performance data um, for many PFAS, for many drinking water treatment technologies. And so we're gathering data from all different sources. We're doing some bench and pilot scale testing of different technologies and just trying to expand the database that exists of what different treatments are effective for what different PFAS chemicals and what's the cost of, of building and maintaining and operating those because we're trying to ultimately um, develop a database that could be used uh, by utilities, by local communities to make decisions about what particular solution is best um, at their local situation. And so we maintain a drinking water treatability database online. Um, it's been updated for 22 PFAS chemicals, um, including a range of, of 4 to 13 carbon chain lengths. Next slide, please. Um, we're also heavily involved in contaminated site remediation, so providing support to our, our Superfund and our um, RICRA office that are responsible for helping to clean up a lot of contaminated sites. Um, coming up with different ways to characterize what is the particular PFAS source at a site. And there's a lot of differences, for example, between firefighting training, emergency response sites, manufacturing facilities, um, disposal sites. So trying to, to understand what are the different, um, different attributes of the sources that occur at those sites and then evaluate different technologies for remediating those, remediating those PFAS impacted soils and waters um, and sediments and trying to collect the performance data and the cost data, again, so that we can inform the, the responsible manager of a, of a particular site what their options are uh, and what the cost would be to, to conduct some remediation. Next slide, please. <coughs> uh, materials management, what we used to call waste management. Um, we do a lot of research on this because in particular with PFAS, because they have such a, a persistence in the environment, they have very long lives. And, and so managing and, and being aware of that whole life cycle um, of a PFAS product from its initial, its initial production through its use and ultimately its disposal is very important because we want to prevent against just uh, casually discharging more PFAS into the environment and just recycling it around. So we have research underway trying to characterize um, and understand different end-of-life disposal streams. So for example, municipal waste versus industrial waste versus landfills, recycled waste streams. These are different ways that PFAS can enter or re-enter the environment. Um, we're studying different um, waste management technologies um, to manage PFAS at the end-of-life disposal. So for example, how do you safely um, landfill PFAS-containing materials? Or what are the uh, potential options for incineration or, or treating PFAS in a way that actually uh, destroys it and doesn't just remobilize it in the atmosphere. And so again, collecting performance and cost data, making that available to uh, the responsible managers for managing these materials um, and just trying to prevent against uh, further contamination down the line. Next slide, please. <coughs> so as I mentioned at the start, um, it's a very broad set of, of problems and challenges and issues with PFAS. It, it's much more than any one agency could handle all by itself. And so we have a lot of of active collaborations underway um, with different parties, different colleagues. We're working with the uh, National Toxicology Program, um, National Institute of Environmental Health and Science, on some of the high throughput tox testing. Uh, we have a lot of collaboration underway with Department of Defense, um, both on the analytical method development, as well as uh, a lot of the treatment and remediation research that gets done. And we participate in their um, strategic environmental research and development program. We have a lot of collaborations with individual states and public utilities. Um, we do a lot of technical support, working with states when they have a particular PFAS problem that they're trying to understand. We're working with utilities to help um, them decide which treatment methods are, are best suited for their situation. That benefits us because we can often do a, some very good applied research and get some very good relevant data from that. And then, of course, a lot of collaboration with the academic community. We have a, a Science to Achieve Results a competitive external grant program and we're starting to release some requests for proposals through that that are focusing on PFAS. Next slide, please. So my final slide, uh, my contact information. Um, if anybody would like to uh, follow up on any of these, I'd be, be happy to uh, discuss that. We are putting our information up on the EPA's PFAS uh, website as it becomes available, and uh, look forward to, to many more years of uh, collaborations on this. So thanks, Nick, back to you. Great, <clears throat> thank you so much, Dr. Gillespie. Um, all right, well, we, we have a few uh, minutes here um, to take some questions. Um, so we can take some questions through the chat box, uh, and we can also take some questions uh, through um, the phone. So to unmute yourself, please use star six um, and let us know your name and um, organizational affiliation and go ahead with your questions. So we'll take a few uh, voice questions first, and then I'll, I'll select a few from the chat as well. 
So any, any questions? Hi, this is Steve Holtzman with Washington State Department of Health. Hi, Steve. We can hear you. Question I have is it was stated earlier that um, the main uh, exposure route for PFAS is thought to be ingestion. Um, <clears throat> how do we know that that is indeed the main exposure route and that PFAS are not significantly acquired through um, uh, well, drinking water was was one of the main ingestion routes. How do we know that there's not significant exposure to PFAS through food and also through um, um, an inhalation of dust uh, from um, that have been in contact with PFAS on, on carpets and, and, and other surfaces treated with PFAS? Chris, do you want to start on this one? I think that was your slide. Uh, well, I, I was I had already unmuted and was ready to answer. So first, the dust uh, uh, part of this is that is something that we're interested in, and that is why we're collecting the samples of household dust to to try to uh, start to get a handle on whether the dust generated from stain resistant fabrics or or flame retardant or flame retardants on on furniture whatever the source is, it, how that household dust can contribute to the exposure profile. The, the uh, diet part is something we, we are interested in. Right now, our studies are focused on, on drinking water because we feel like that's the, the major source, but we also are interested in understanding the diet component. And so when I talked about some of the other projects that we're looking at, one of the things that we have just started talking about is looking at uh, uh, how to estimate dietary exposures to PFAS and, and looking at some of the models that are out for determining dietary exposures to chemicals and other substances and how can we apply that to PFAS. So uh, that, is, that, that is where we are right now. We are focused mostly on on the drinking water, but we are also interested in the other routes of exposure. And, and we even take it, and we even, I, I want to just add this, is, is we also take it further because in some of our studies, we are looking at, at children and pediatric exposures. And so looking at the roles of breastfeeding and, and lactation in PFAS exposure. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Ray. Um, here's a, a question uh, from the chat um, from the, let's see, the Arizona um, Department of Environmental Quality. Um, what work research has been done towards de destroying PFAS as opposed to removing it from drinking water? Um, this is Andy, I can take a cut at that. Um, there's a lot of research underway right now at all different kinds of, of technologies. Um, looking at ways of actually trying to destroy the molecules themselves, to break apart that carbon fluorine bond. There was a review paper, I think, in the last year or two, um, I, I could send the citation to Nick afterwards, there was a survey of some of these technologies, um, and, I was, and, and I was at a meeting in Denver a few months ago, the uh, Remediation Technology Conference, where there was a, just a lot of presentations on that. Um, the work to date really has been done at the bench scale. So. I think the question is, how can it be scaled up or whether it can be affordable you know, to scale up some of these, uh, what to me look like fairly exotic uh, laboratory pilot technologies into something that could operate at the scale of, say, a landfill. Um, the one technology that we're most familiar with is incineration. And there's honestly not a whole lot of data that we've been able to uncover on what are the best practices for doing incineration of PFAS containing materials to make sure that you actually destroy them as opposed to just remobilizing them. So we've got some research that's getting started looking at that. Everything that we've seen so far indicates that you need pretty high temperatures, something like 900 degrees Celsius, to actually break apart those molecules. So there is some work being done, um, not a whole lot of, of clear best practices at current for anything other than incineration at a large scale. Great, thanks for that response. Um, any other voice questions? Questions from the phone? All right, so we'll take another question from the chat. Um, this is um, from Heidi in New Mexico. So um, when does EPA expect to complete the five additional PFAS 
um, in Iris. Um, I can probably take a cut at that. Um, are you familiar with the IRIS program? Um, maybe that's a rhetorical question. Um, so these are, you know, these are complex, um, lengthy processes that we have to go through. There's a, a period of public comment that will be um, given for each assessment. Um, there's an external peer review that will be conducted. There's interagency consultations. And so if you actually go on the IRIS website, um, they publish what they call a program outlook at periodic intervals. And the, uh, the schedules for the current five assessments are listed um, in that outlook. And I think the, um, the final drafts are right now, the goal is to get them posted in 2021. And that's after those steps of a public comment period, um, an external peer review, interagency consultations, and, and the final assessment. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gillespie. Uh, another question from the chat from Adam Vander Hayden. Uh, is there a timeline for enforceable drinking water standards? This is Hannah. I, I can take this one. So, um, so EPA within the action plan committed to um, completing or proposing a regulatory determinations for PFOA, PFOS um, by by the end of 2019. Um, and so, um, through that process, as part of the Space Drinking Water Act process that EPA is committed to following, the process for evaluating and establishing um, drinking water standards. Um, and the process, um, similar to, to the IRS assessment, it ensures public participation and transparency. To, so there'll be an opportunity once those are proposed for public comment. Um, and EPA will continue to use the best available peer-reviewed science and other technical information to inform. Um, and so proposing regulatory determination is the next step within the regulatory process. And that will enable the public to share additional information um, that, that will be critical to, to that regulatory uh, decision making. Great, thank you so much, Hannah. And last question for the day um, from Alex Bogdan. Is the agency considering fast tracking experiments with those new previously unknown PFAS compounds found in the Cape Fear biomonitoring? Um, well, this is Andy. Um, so I think at least one or two of those compounds are included in our set of 150 as representative of those particular you know, classes of chemical physical structures. Um, at the present, we don't have any plans to fast track any other research beyond that set of 150 and those assays. So for example, we're gonna wait until we get the results of those assays and we have a better understanding of what the, what the relative toxicity is of those different chemical categories. Uh, and then we would make some decisions about prioritizing chemicals for further um, assessment. So, so this is Chris with ATSDR. We have an, uh, this is a question that we're, we're keenly interested in, and we have an internal team of epidemiologists, toxicologists, and uh, some of our laboratory people where we're asking the questions around what are the information gaps in the hypotheses that need to be answered, especially around uh, uh, these new and previously unknown PFAS compounds and what are the right protocols that we can put in place and, and how can we get information out related to these uh, in, in a timely manner. So we're, st we're in the initial stages. Uh, uh, this is something that we've only had in place for a few months, but we definitely are, are are working to better understand what our approach will be for understanding what are these new and previously unknown PFAS compounds and how do we respond to them from a public health and a research basis. Great, thank you much. Uh, thank you so much for those uh, answers for you both. Um, great, well, thank you uh, for participating in uh, today's webinar. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity again to thank the speakers uh, for their time and support. We really appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to come and um, speak to the group. Um, we hope that today's presentation has provided additional insight on the federal initiatives to address environmental PFAS contamination. Um, thanks so much, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Um, this concludes the webinar. You may now disconnect.